Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, hopefully it's coming loud and clear. Um, so this is a very exciting topic for me, and uh, so hopefully uh, you'll find that too. Uh, but uh, in terms of a show of hands, uh, how many people are using AI on OpenShift and Kubernetes? Or intend to use in the next few months? Or OK, cool. That's a good, good set of people. Uh, how, how many people are getting to like inferencing in those advanced topics uh, on OpenShift? A little bit. So uh, you know, Tripti is going to talk about that, and she's going to explain to us what inferencing is. Uh, in the way of introduction, uh, I'm Tushar Katarki. I am a product manager on OpenShift, uh, kind of uh, involved in a bunch of AI initiatives. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, a little later towards the end. And, uh, with, and Tripti Single is uh, a product manager for NVIDIA, and she focuses on deep learning and inferencing software there. And she has a very exciting uh, lineup for us. So without a further ado, I will hand over the mic to Tripti. All right. Do you, do you have that? Do you want to check if this works? <laughs> All right, thanks so much. OK, so this is just a quick agenda. Um, I'll start off with a brief overview of what deep learning is and focus a little bit more on the inference side. And then I'll jump right into the NVIDIA TensorRT inference server, which was announced in September. So fairly new. Um, I'll go into the features, um, the internal architecture, where it fits into the larger inference ecosystem. Um, I'll ha I have one quick performance slide, and then I'll jump into a uh, demo. And then I'll pass it back to Tushar to talk about OpenShift and Kubernetes. So deep learning at a high level is the idea of using large amounts of data to train neural networks, teach these neural networks how to make human-like decisions. And so it's typically broken down into training and inference, and inference is what I'll be focusing on mostly today. Um, training is uh, using large amounts of data, teaching these neural networks uh, how, to how to make these human-like decisions. And then inference is uh, taking that train, trained model that's been iterated over with that data several times and then deploying it into the real world and uh, giving it new data to make new decisions and new predictions. So that's deep learning at a high level. Like I said, I'll be focusing more on the inference side and um, the TensorRT inference server. So focusing more on inference and why GPUs are necessary, there's this idea of PLASTER, which stands for programmability, low latency, accuracy, size of the network, throughput, efficiency, and the rate of learning. <laughs> um, so as you can see, latency and speed is not the only factor here. Uh, all these factors contribute to a successful inference deployment and um, using GPUs delivers on all these factors. So the main problem that most people run into when deploying an inference workflow is the problem of inefficiency. And this includes not being able to run several models at the same time on one GPU. So if on, this, on this example on the far left, um, users may want to run several different types of deep learning models, whether it's a speech recognition model, a language processing model, um, or a deep recommender model. And if each GPU is dedicated to that model and one spikes, like in this example, the speech, um, the speech model spiked up, the other GPUs are left um, underutilized. And that's pretty inefficient. Also, solutions today typically only offer support for one framework. And that really restricts your teams, internal teams working on uh, developing these AI um, models. It restricts them to that one framework. And um, it, it may, yeah, and so they, if, they, if they feel like they, some teams work in PyTorch, some teams work in, um, in TensorFlow, there's not one uh, that uses it all. And so that's the, that's the issue today. And then when it comes to custom development, there, uh, like I said, there's several teams developing different um, solutions and solving for different tasks, whether it's visual search, recommendations, and so on. Um, if each team builds out their own pipeline, their own custom pipeline for those, um, that's not very efficient because they're all really doing the same underlying task, which is inference. 
and um, really having one, one solution that handles it all um, makes managing those pipelines much easier. So the NVIDIA TensorRT inference server, like I said, was announced in September and is also now open sourced as of about three weeks ago. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is just a high level overview of where it fits into the larger ecosystem. On the left, you'll see the clients sending in requests and um, to some sort of cloud application running on the, in the data center. And from there, those requests are sent to a load balancer, which directs traffic to, um, to the appropriate instance of the TensorRT inference server. So in this case, there's three instances running and uh, all the underlying hardware is visible to the inference server, including heterogeneous GPUs, which is why I've listed um, T4, V100, and P4 there. Um, like I said, it, it integrates with all orchestration um, systems, such as Kubernetes, and, um, yeah, and like I said, it's open source and available on GitHub. Sorry. So here are some of the current features. Uh, that the TensorRT inference server has to offer. And just to uh, single out a few, we can s kind of separate them between to um, performance features and usability features. So um, for performance, uh, there's a feature called concurrent ex model execution, which is what allows you to run multiple models or multiple um, instances of the same model on one GPU at one time. So this is, this is how you're really going to uh, maximize the utiliz utilization of your GPU and um, get the most capacity there. And with dynamic batching, you're able to uh, batch up your inference requests inside the inference server based on a user-defined SLA, a latency SLA, um, rather than having to build that logic outside of the inference server. And so now for more of us usability features, um, the TensorRT inference server exposes metrics such as for utilization, count, and latency to enable auto scaling. And um, we support multiple model frameworks such as uh, Facebook's TensorFlow um, and uh, uh, NVIDIA's TensorRT and CAFE2 through the Onyx import path. So this is just a, a deeper dive into the inference server internal architecture. So the green box here on the left represents the inference server itself. You have our client uh, requests coming in from the top through the HTTP or gRPC endpoints. And there's also a Python or C++ client library that enables that interaction between client and server. From there, requests are sent through to request handling. And in this case, it's a simple image classification um, example with identifying between dog and cat. And then um, they go through to the per model scheduling queues. And this would be based on what kind of uh, model it is. So in this case, it's an image classification model. So based on that, in the, in the, request, um, in the request itself, it will go to the scheduler queue for that particular model that's needed to execute that in, on that inference. And from there, it's sent to the framework backends that actually does the inference compute. And if that image classification model was written in TensorFlow, it will go to the TensorFlow backend. And from there, the result is sent back up through the um, response handling and back up to the client. One thing to note here is at the bottom, the metrics are exposed through an ex uh, a separate HTTP endpoint, and the models that are used in the um, inside the inference server are uh, are visible through a model repository that's a persistent volume. Okay, so that was that was kind of a zoom. What we just saw was kind of a zoomed-in view of what is inside the inference server, and now we're taking a step back, zooming out and looking at where it fits into the larger inference ecosystem. So um, you'll notice that at the far right is the inference server. I guess I can move my mouse here. So that, that's what I just showed you, the zoomed in portion. And now starting on the left hand side, the user in this, uh, as an example workflow, you can say a user uploads an image. And um, 
it's sent to an to some sort of application through to a client API, and some pre pre and post processing is done on it. And this could be image cropping or scaling, or maybe the model requires a mask over it. And it, so that's sort of the pre the pre processing that go, that happens. After that. The pre-processed data goes through to a load balancer that can direct traffic to the proper instance of the inference server. And like I mentioned, the model repository um, is mounted into that inference server as well. And so now the inference server is running that model, whether it's image classification, whatever model it may be, and it's sending responses back, and it's, it's doing this um, as requests come in. And at the same time, metrics are exposed through um, and uh, to enable auto scaling and to um, be able to spin up new insta instances. And so um, metrics such as uh, queue time and GPU utilization, when those kind of go up, it's a good indicator of that it's time to spin up a new instance. And then you'll also notice a dotted line around, the, uh, around that portion, and that uh, shows our collaboration with Kubeflow to support the TensorRT inference server. And so there's a detailed blog describing that collaboration, and all the code is available on GitHub. Okay, so this, um, the chart on the right shows the performance gains you get when using the TensorRT inference server across um, three separate deployments of ResNet 50, which is an image classification model. It's the typical one used for um, performance benchmarking. And so TensorFlow FP32 on CPU and GPU, and then you'll obviously see the most performance gain when using the NVIDIA TensorRT version of the ResNet 50. And the main takeaways, the key takeaways here are that uh, the inference server supports CPU and GPU, as well as uh, TensorFlow native and the NVIDIA TensorRT plans that I mentioned. And this is all under a 50 millisecond uh, latency SLA across all deployments. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll jump into a demo. So this is a video. Hold on. So this is actually a video of the of our TensorRT inference server flowers demo, and there's a live version of this that will be running at our booth. So feel free to check it out. Um, so let me just describe what you're seeing here. At the top is our flowers client. And so all those little images are images of flowers being classified, whether it's um, a daisy or a rose or so on. Um, and this flashing bar going down indicates that classification. So all these images are being classified. And it's, it's moving down like that. And so at the bottom left corner over here, um, we've uh, put images per second, the demand, and what's being delivered. So at this point, it's 800, and we're meeting that demand at 800. And so at the bottom, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we have two dashboards which give us some insight on uh, what's happening in the data center. On the left is, is a cluster that um, is a manual deployment of, of these models without the TensorRT inference server. And on the right is a cluster with TensorRT inference server enabled. And at the bottom, you'll notice that it's broken down into a per GPU utilization. Um, and uh, the percentage of models loaded onto the GPU is indicated by color. So focusing on the left side, the left dashboard, um, each, each GPU is dedicated to a single model. So there's a blue model, a green model, an orange model, and a yellow model. And so the blue model in this case will be the flowers, the flowers model that you see running right now. Um, the, this dial over here shows average GPU utilization, so it's 20% right now. And soon what you'll see happen is, I can skip forward a little bit. So what just happened was the demand increased, we increased the demand to 5,000 images per second. And keep in mind that we're still directing traffic to the, the manual no TensorRT inference server um, cluster. And so you'll notice that the two GPUs that are running this flowers model are completely maxed out, while the other models, whether it's a um, deep recommender or anything like that, those, those GPUs are under, are remain underutilized. You see the spike on the chart happen there. And the average, the average GPU utilization is around 38. Um, and so, 
a typical solution here would be to increase the hardware and just add more GPUs to support this, this flowers model. Um, but you're still left with underutilized hardware in your data center, which is really inefficient. And you'll also notice in the images per second on the bottom left corner that we're not meeting the 5,000 images per second demand. We're only getting around 4,800. So that's not ideal in a production workflow. So soon what will happen is um, we'll, drop, we'll stop the traffic going to the, um, the non-TensorRT inference server uh, uh, cluster and we'll move all that traffic to the enabled one with TensorRT and server. And you'll see it drop, uh, soon enough, you'll see it drop in on the left and peak on the right, there it goes. And um, at the bottom all eight GPUs have all four models loaded onto it. So when this peak happens, you'll notice that beforehand the GPU utilization was around maybe 17%, I think, and now it's back, it's up to 39 or 40%. Similar to the manual, um, to the manual deployment, um, but this one, you get the same average GPU utilization, but in this case, all your hardware is being utilized. And you, you can also see that we're easily meeting the demand of 5,000 images per second. Um, with plenty of capacity to even spin up a new workload or um, add or increase the demand. And so another thing uh, to make it more realistic is that we show that um, it can also, with the TensorRT inference server enabled and having your models evenly distributed across your hardware, you can um, increase and decrease your demand like a typical spiky, bursty, um, workload would actually be like because any model can spike at any time and your hardware really has to accommodate for that. And so maybe I can skip a little bit. So here we go. Um, we've increased the demand to 15,000 images per second and we'll go back down to five and go back up and um, kind of imitate or simulate a spiky workload here. And you'll see that the GPU utilization goes up and down, and all the GPUs, all eight GPUs, are being utilized. And so you can see that happen. <clears throat> and none of them are really being maxed out yet. The fact that they're, the fact that they're um, distributed across all eight GPUs allows for more capacity to be able to handle that spiky workload. And so in a little bit, you'll see that with this configuration, we're actually able to get to 18,000 images per second, if you notice the gray box there. Um, 18,000 images per second, and we're, we've completely maxed out our GPU utilization, and this is using the TensorRT inference server. So there you go, see, that's 95%. All GPUs are being used. And we're, we're pretty much meeting the 18,000 images per second. There it is. Okay. So, I'll go ahead and hand it back to Tushar, who will talk about OpenShift and Kubernetes and the, and the road ahead. Wow, that's cool. So with that, uh, let me now jump back and see what we can do um, with um, OpenShift here, just a moment. Need to escape that. Let's do it this way. All right, uh, so as I said, um, so, um, so what can we do with this beautiful demo and the TensorRT inference server and what's the road ahead uh, for this on OpenShift with deep learning on OpenShift is what I'm going to describe next. We'll start with that basic TensorRT inference server that we saw the demo for that Tripti described a little earlier. And then we'll say, oh, that's actually a bunch of containers and so the containers need a container platform, and so we talked all day about it. Today, so we got OpenShift Container Platform, uh, which is basically Kubernetes. Uh, it can run across data center and cloud, and by the way, it supports GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, and therefore, you can run it uh, either on the data center or on the cloud, or a combination uh, of those two. Okay, but now you have the TensorRT inference server, but now you need a, you, you actually need to use it. Maybe, um, uh, as Tripti described, maybe it's part of a um, you know, recommendation system or you have a, uh, you have a chat bot 
uh, which is using na uh, natural language processing. Uh, you know, so you have an app uh, that you want to create and you want to deploy it in production. So you have your cloud native intelligent app, and that's running on TensorRT inference server. And 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 by the way, uh, it needs a uh, things such as uh, load balancing. It th it needs things such as routing. It needs encryption. Uh, then we have the OpenShift service mesh that was talked about earlier. Um, so this is kind of a, of your production setup. Now you have a cloud native intelligent app which is actually using the TensorRT inference server and the underlying infrastructure that is provided by OpenShift to, uh, for this to be deployed in, uh, shown in production, right? So now, okay, but where did these models come from, right? Somebody has to actually create these models. So you can use more, uh, OpenShift as a platform to train your models. Your data scientists can do that uh, using uh, bring your own or Actually, NVIDIA has a bunch of uh, pre-frameworks, um, uh, uh, such as uh, for uh, TensorFlow, et cetera, that they call uh, NVIDIA NGC, which is NVIDIA GPU Cloud Container. So you can run them on top of OpenShift. Um, and so there you got your data scientists have access to uh, the best of the best uh, frameworks to create the models uh, for, to feed into this TensorRT inference server. Okay. so. What's next? So, but as you saw earlier, you probably need to do some pre-processing of the data, some post-processing of the data. You need to set up the uh, data pipelines. Your data scientists might want to, um, you know, visualize uh, the data that is coming in using Jupyter, uh, something that they might be used to. They want to use Kafka uh, for as a message bus, and maybe use, um, you know, a Spark uh, for uh, real-time processing, so all those patterns are available on OpenShift, and you'll, I won't go into the details of that, but um, you know, I'll, I'll describe some references in the end, and all these different quote-unquote um, frameworks can run on top of OpenShift. So now what do you have? You have your inference server, you have your uh, models, you have set up your data pipelines on OpenShift. Now what you want to do is you also want to actually you know, uh, write your cloud native application, you want your developers to do that. So that is something that obviously, um, you know, um, OpenShift is not just a container platform, but also a DevOps platform. And that's where you obviously can use existing patterns, Jenkins that we already ship, or in the future, K native with, um, you know, things such as build event and ser serverless uh, on top of uh, OpenShift. So that's, that gives you an idea of uh, how OpenShift can be used in this entire ecosystem from end to end. And some of the things that have happened so far really are things such as um, uh, device manager support, uh, which enable the support of GPUs. Uh, they have been available, uh, I'd say, for about a couple of releases already. Um, we have introduced other uh, features with the community, such as priority and preemption, which can be used uh, uh, which will become, become essential if you're trying to do uh, things such as model training uh, and, uh, and using jobs, for example. Uh, so recently, back in October, we announced uh, jointly with NVIDIA uh, support for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, which is certified now on DGS, DGX1 and Tesla GPUs, which is basically DGX1 is the a GPU appliance uh, from NVIDIA. And um, that, that, that support is available now on uh, OpenShift and RHEL. And then here we're showing you a preview of TensorRT inference server on OpenShift. Uh, we are planning to write a reference architecture. And obviously, the road ahead is really to uh, make this a much easier deployment, uh, deploy experience, install experience with operators. Uh, we have other exciting stuff that we're going to talk at KubeCon over the next couple of days with the community on doing things such as GPU sharing, heterogeneous clusters, for example, how do we have, uh, I mean, this picture on the left here, uh, it, it looks nice, but some of these things, the heterogeneous clusters still is work that needs to be done up in the upstream community. So those are some things, uh, GPU uh, topology is another thing that we are working on. So, so if you step back now, um, you know, what, uh, how does Red Hat see AI? Um, you know, I think one of the, uh, the four pillars, uh, um, you know, here as you can see, running um, AI as a workload on top of OpenShift and, um, you know, our 
uh, ecosystem is obviously the uh, first pillar, and you saw a little bit of that today. On the rightmost is how do you build intelligent applications? I thought I touched a little bit about uh, that also. So if you're going to build an intelligent application which uses AI, uh, how do you build that? And then there are the two in the middle, uh, which is basically the first one really is um, how do we um, and continue to um, um, uh, enhance our core business using open source tools and AI. And the uh, second one really is, um, you know, how do we uh, enhance our products itself using AI. This is where uh, Chris Wright was pointing out earlier about uh, um, automation and uh, self-driving, uh, you know, products and self-driving um, uh, components. So, so that's kind of how Red Hat sees with, oh, I, I missed the most important piece uh, with data as a foundation. And so you'll, uh, you'll hear some of this in our, uh, throughout the discussion uh, over the next few days. Uh, so here are some references and KubeCon highlights uh, to round this up. Um, you know, uh, NVIDIA is going to present basically uh, scaling AI inference workloads, what you saw today uh, at a much larger breakout session. Uh, first, that's uh, on tomorrow. Tuesday, December 11, I believe it's at 1.45 p.m. Uh, then we have on Thursday, uh, Red Hat, uh, uh, some, some of the Red Hat engineers are going to uh, talk about that uh, uh, last bullet that I was showing earlier, or the last box, about how to build uh, uh, deep learning through K-native uh, serverless framework. Uh, then we have uh, several other blogs here. The first one talks about how to use the TensorRT uh, inference server. Uh, the second one is using Kubeflow. Tripti mentioned how to use Kubeflow to deploy the TensorRT inference server on Kubernetes. Uh, and then the last one is actually uh, on how to basically enable GPUs on OpenShift. So, um, so these are some of the uh, resources that you have. There's a webinar which is coming, for, uh, and Joey, I'll introduce him in just a moment, uh, uh, which talks about how to maximize GPU utilization. Um, there we have booth setups, both at the NVIDIA and Red Hat booth, so come and check it out. And as Tripti mentioned, there's a live demo going on there. Uh, then I want to also mention that the TensorRT inference server is open source. It's available on GitHub. You'll find a link there, and then the OpenShift Commons, uh, uh, machine learning SIG, that's something where uh, we as a community from OpenShift uh, and, and, and NVIDIA and others, we, we get together and talk about um, uh, machine learning. And then we have Open Data Hub, which is some of the four pillars that I talked about. This is a uh, Red Hat CTO office initiative, uh, and they are trying to build a uh, data hub that I described earlier in the four pillars uh, in an open way. So there are plenty of resources, lots of excitement, um, you know, so I hope uh, you guys can participate in that. And uh, with that, uh, I think, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tripti. Thank you, NVIDIA. And I'll hand back to Diane. One of, the, one of these will work. All right, maybe both of them.